Hello, viewers. Welcome to our coronavirus outbreak conversation. Today, we will discuss on coronavirus pandemic as we are doing. And today, we'll discuss its impact on our livelihood, economy, and international relations as well. Let's introduce our panel, Ambassador William B. Maidam, Senior Scholar of the Wilson Center, uh, Washington, President of the Washington based right to, right to Freedom, and former US Ambassador in Bangladesh. And we are delighted to have uh, Professor Dr. Ali Riaz, Distinguished Professor of the Illinois State University at Politics and Government, an eminent writer and political scientist. So how are you today, Ambassador Bill? I am quite well, thank you, Mushfiq. I, I'm in, I, uh, as well as one can be when one is social distancing, that is sort of being isolated from everybody else. I rarely get out uh, except to walk uh, every day. And I couldn't even walk today because it was raining here. Uh, but uh, I'm doing okay, I guess. Uh, so you are not having hydroxychloroquine, by the way? Uh, no, I haven't started that, and I don't plan to, actually. Uh, I've, uh, you know, what I uh, believe uh, about our president is one thing, that he doesn't, he's not a doctor, and two, that he doesn't know what the heck he's doing. So anyway, uh, let him go chomping away at that if he wants. How are you, Professor Dr. Ali Riaz? I'm doing okay as much as I could. I mean, given the uh, circumstances, being at home, yes, Bill, we were having some rain too for the last couple of days in central Illinois, and hence the no walking outside. But almost it, is, it has been almost three months that I have been practically at home, <laughs> barring few once in a uh, you know, while went out for just picking up the grocery. Most of the groceries are now delivered. At home. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but otherwise, Managing well, <laughs> let me put it this way. Okay, let's start with Professor Dr. Ali Riaz. Uh, USA has 5% of uh, world population, but more than 30% corona outbreak is here. Now the country deaths toll near 100,000. So what is your observation? Why is that? It is already pretty much evident and proven that it is the failure of the leadership that has took us into this kind of situation. President Trump and his administration ignored all the warning signs, left us un completely unprepared, and more importantly, that he didn't listen to the scientists. Science was ignored, preparation was absent, and in many instances, the support and the resources that were supposed to be dedicated to address this the very beginning wasn't done so that is the federal level uh, leadership uh, uh, crisis we have also seen in many instances some of the states didn't do very well either for example new york should have been actually uh, started its lockdown at least a week or two before what when they start that would have prevented at least thirty thousand or so there less number of them so i, I my primary argument should be that it is the failure of leadership, lack of resources, and most importantly, that uh, the way it should have been coordinated, it hasn't been coordinated. Okay. Ambassador Bill, President Donald Trump has argued it is a badge of honor that the USA has the world's highest number of confirmed COVID-19 infections. Do you agree with that? Are you feeling honor? A badge of honor that we have the most infections? Yeah. I hadn't heard him say that, but that only makes me think even less well of him, uh, which I didn't think very well of him before. So uh, you haven't helped my his standing with me, uh, Mushfiq. The uh, answer is uh, it's uh, it's it's worse than uh, 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 it's not a badge of honor. It's a badge of, of dishonor, actually. 
and the dishonor, as I as as Ali says, it's basically uh, on this government, uh, uh, on his own government, which fiddled around, which didn't take this thing seriously for at least ninety days. Uh, I'm uh, I'm sorry, nine. Uh, yeah, well, from January through through mid March, about forty five days. Um, when it, and and there's now a Columbia University study out which says had they had they had the government moved to social distancing the same mis measures that it moved to in mid March had it moved a week earlier it would have uh, there would be thirty six thousand I think the word number is thirty six thousand fewer deaths and had it been two weeks it would be fifty four thousand fewer deaths. So the fact that we didn't do anything in terms of social distancing for a long period of time, while he tried to make it appear as if that, as if it wasn't a very big, uh, a very serious uh, challenge uh, and a very serious threat, is uh, responsible for a whole lot of unnecessary deaths. Now the, he, he told he mentioned that. Uh... Uh, they, because USA is testing more people than any other country of the world. That's why it's a badge of honor to, to having that much, you know, infected people in a country. Is, is that right? Um, oh, well, of course, he lied there because there, the, we are testing more than any other country in the world. We have, we've had, I don't know where we are on the testing list, but we're, we haven't, in terms of our population, we haven't tested very many people at all, four or five percent, I think. Um, Maybe, maybe I'm a little low because we're getting better on testing all the time. But the governors of the states have basically run the show against, uh, against uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and it's, it's to them that if we are testing well now, it's to their credit, none to his. Yeah, uh, Professor Ali Riaz, I need to mention that Professor Ali Riaz uh, is a non-resident fellow of the Atlantic Council. And I want to ask you, you want to blame China for this pandemic? As the President Trump and State Department, they are blaming China that this virus started from China, from the lab, not from the market. So you want to blame the China for this? No, I'm not blaming China. What I'm saying is that, and this has been my position from the get go, that whether it has come from the lab is uh, something that, that is a matter of investigation. So far, the scientists have confirmed that it has come from the wet market in Wuhan. Let's start with that one. That let us take until we get something else. I'm not going to speculate because I'm neither in a position nor I'm going to encourage speculation or the conspiracy theory. Having said that, what happened is the first identification of this virus was early in December, 10th of December to be precise. It took 21 days for the Chinese authority to report it to WHO Beijing office. So losing 21 days. Those who have identified were muzzled and in some cases persecuted. Uh, I, I'm talking of the doctors in China. Then they have not provided an, enough information and was not transparent enough uh, because of the system of lack of accountability. So here is my position that had China been more transparent, had China been actually more effectively and promptly responded and provided information, it would have been easier for others to interject and possibly less number of deaths. And this is the responsibility China will have to bear. That is my position. And I think that should be investigated. Here I am, based on what is publicly available information, I'm suggesting this. Am I going to say the last word? I'm not going to say the last word. Let us investigate and see how lack of transparency, lack of, lack of accountability from the China spot have contributed to this pandemic spread, if not the origin. Definitely it has come from somewhere and that is, that is a matter of, uh, matter of more inquiry because uh, the scientist community need to understand how it started. Because if we really want to prevent another pandemic like this, shouldn't we know where it started, how it started, what actually contributed, how it spread? Those are my concerns. And here I am I, completely different from Mr. Trump. I don't agree with Mr. Trump's position. 
that blaming and pointing finger is going to do because what he is doing, he's trying to shift the blame to China because of his lack of you know, effectiveness, his lack of actions. As Ambassador Milam has already noted, that at least 45 days, he has uh, practically undermined and replayed this crisis, right? So now he cannot, he doesn't want to take the responsibility. You want to anything add, Ambassador Milam? Well, I, 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 I think that um, this whole thing about China is kind of a, a red herring, if you will. I'm sure that China did not act uh, totally appropriately, that it, uh, it, that it's, China is not a very transparent country. It's an authoritarian country, a ri very rigorously authoritarian country. So there's no doubt that it probably covered up uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, outbreak of the coronavirus when it first uh, broke out, as as you as you would. But listen, uh, how do we know? How can we say that it would have been things would have been any different? Would President Trump have taken the uh, the information that came out of China even earlier and and made any would that have made any difference or would he have just downplayed it as he can as he did? I am not convinced that anything would have changed if uh, China had been totally transparent. So I think it's a, a, a kind of political red herring. Uh, so that's my view. But uh, I'm not trying to absolve China. I just think that. In the case of the United States, at least, in the case of the United States, the president is fully responsible for uh, uh, those excess deaths that have occurred. Uh, uh, let me echo Ambassador Myla. I am not suggesting that the, the things might have been different, given the reluctance and, to a great extent, uh, irresponsible behavior of the president and his administration. What I'm suggesting with respect to this China's uh, responsibility is to the international community, the world. Uh, if uh, the international community had a different, you know, you know, pieces of information, would they have acted differently? Uh, maybe, maybe not. And that would be the that would be their responsibility, as it is in case of President Trump. It is his responsibility and his failure that has put us in this kind of situation. Yes, I didn't mean to infer that uh, or, or imply i should say really that you were uh, uh, not uh, that what you said about china was not accurate and, and didn't apply to the total world i just to what happened in the united states and i don't think trump would have acted any differently had he known or had the u.s known weeks earlier uh, about anything about the outbreak uh, Professor Aliri, as you were closely observing the Bangladesh situation, and uh, Bangladeshi people, mostly the, our viewers, want to listen to you. So how you are observing the, the situation? Do you think Bangladesh current regime is on right track to tackle this pandemic as we are, every day we are learning from the sport that uh, uh, people are dying without any having any treatment, and people are suffering for food, and the pro-government activists, they are, you know, stealing the relief materials, even the stimulus package, you know. So what is your observation and how can we survive, uh, uh, Bangladeshi people survive from this? In case of Bangladesh, from the very beginning, pretty much akin to, <laughs> to the U.S. administration, the government has under, uh, underplayed the whole thing. There was no preparedness. Government claimed there was preparedness. The government said that, uh, you know, this is not going to affect us, uh, so on and so forth. So what we have seen from the very beginning of this crisis, with respect to the public health crisis, was that the people were not tested. The number of tests was very small. Even now, it is very small compared to Bangladesh, 160 million people. I'm not suggesting everyone is going to be tested. Those who have the symptoms at least okay. needed to, that hasn't been done. I mean, and then the second thing is the entire public health infrastructure almost collapsed because even those who are not infected are not getting the treatment for the simple thing, even if it is fever or something else, the routine, the regular thing, they're not being treated because the healthcare facilities, 
over the years for a number of reasons from from you know uh, lack of resource that means not investment in the public health sector to the corruption that we have seen all these things have created a situation wherein there is no public health infrastructure that can withstand this kind of situation let alone even the regular situation is not good so that that being said then there is this denial part that we have seen that the counting is so low, low counting if you look at the symptoms is you know there are more than thousand people have already died of those symptoms if they have been tested in many cases even after their death they have not been tested and i we don't know even the figure is the thousand is the correct number because these are based on the press reports there are many instances uh, in bangladesh even in regular situation uh, it has not been reported so if you add these symptoms with the official statistics close to 400 plus what do you see it's about 1500 it's not a small number and the infection rate is going high so this seems to be a completed you know disaster in terms of managing it with respect to the economy we have and you have mentioned that uh, there has been uh, pilferage, there is stealing, theft of the relief materials, and then came the stimulus package, and it looks like that it is leaving the most uh, most vulnerable completely behind. Uh, even when the last effort, first of all, the priority. If you look at the priority, the supporting this informal sector and those who are, who are on the bottom of the society with very little resources they have their stimulus package came at the last this is very interesting very interesting because it told us the the priority and then those are also being now reported that there has been misappropriation or attempted misappropriation so all these things from health sectors to economy in terms of economy there is there is, there is this effort but the stimulus packages are not reaching to the people that actually help the economy and without the public health again, let me finally note with this one, that the this lockdown, which is described as a general holiday in Bangladesh, has not been serious, it has not been serious at all. You know? And the public awareness was less, we came out on the streets and, and, the, and then the decision of opening prematurely the government sectors, the factories, the shopping malls, all are contributing to this, uh, this you know, spread of this pandemic because it's a community transmission has already taken place now how do you actually address this without tending to not only testing increasing testing and also making sure that the health infrastructure is there ambassador mylam how are you observing the situation of bangladesh and the reason well you know first of all i i uh defer to Ali, He's the, he really knows a lot more about Bangladesh than I ever did or ever will. Uh, it, it, and what he says sounds uh, quite accurate to me. So I, I don't have really anything to add. Um, one could have expected this. Um, I was, I'm going to sort of move to a little different tack and say that I was interested in a thing that came from the New York Times this morning uh, about Kerala, the state in southern India, which has about 35 million people, uh, not anywhere near what Bangladesh, uh, the population of Bangladesh or the United States. Uh, Kerala has uh, 36, 35, 36 million people. It's quite poor, just like uh, Bangladesh. Um, and it has it saw a uh, the first outbreak of uh, of bong, of uh, uh, coronavirus there sometime in January, uh, pretty much along the lines that everybody else did. Now, how many cases, how many infections do you think there are in Kerala after all this time, and how many deaths? You don't have to answer the question. I'll answer it for you. There's been about 700 cases, 36 million people, and four, four deaths in Kerala. What's the difference? Why is Kerala so different than Bangladesh? Part of the reason is because there's a government system there that works together so that the uh, bureaucracy works with whatever party's in charge. It is not a zero-sum game. 
And as at least I've always said, uh, I've always said, Bangladesh politics are always have always been and seem like they always will be a zero sum game. So nobody ever thinks about the national good as a, as sort of at the beginning of things. They think about what's this mean for me and my party. So I think that there's, uh, you know, that's that. So my lesson is that part of the problem here is just uh, the economic, the political and economic systems that most of the South Asian countries have. And this is sa the same uh, is true for the United States, which is also a zero sum game political uh, system. So that's what I'll I'll say when I when you've given me this opening. Yeah. Uh, Professor Ali Riaz, government is on zero tolerance on freedom of freedom of expression. Attack on free speech is not stopped by the uh, ruling authority. Rather, it is more enhanced in the in this uh, pandemic time even. So what is your observation? Why they are so attacking on free speech? What's the problem with that? I describe this as a pandemic of persecution. Bangladesh has, is facing two pandemic at the same time. Good line. Uh, one is, of course, the pandemic, the public health crisis. Another is this pandemic uh, persecution. You have, you have seen since the beginning of this crisis, what the government has done has tried to muzzle anyone who is speaking out, and particularly in social media. The journalists are already under immense pressure in Bangladesh. Many editors have acknowledged that they exercise uh, you know, self-censorship, reporters do over the last years. And if you look at the Reporters Without Borders ranking, you'll see that over the last two years, 2018 and 19, Bangladesh has dropped five notch in two years. So it is not new that it started during the pandemic. The pandemic has provided an excuse. Now, the point is why the government is doing it. One thing is, that they have already have the, the, the tool at their disposal. That is called Digital Security Act, which they've been using it. They've been using it before. Now they're practically what you described as an enhanced mode. I think for two reasons that we have seen this enhancement. Uh, within the context of already deteriorating press freedom and freedom of expression. One thing is government over the years uh, propagated and this 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 narrative that Bangladesh is doing extremely well in terms of its economy, stellar record, both GDP and all sorts of the what the pandemic has shown that how fragile or practically how hollow that that claim is. If it had eight percent growth rate for, for almost five or ten years, what happened? Why these people are so much in this dire situation that we are seeing? The most vulnerable people, the poverty that we are seeing suddenly within weeks of this situation. So there is a disparity that was created, which they didn't talk about. Now it, it doesn't have to be theoretically explained to you. It is on your face. You can actually see them on the street of Bangladesh, right? So that's number one, that this hollowness of the basic ideological foundation which provided the legitimacy to this government for the last 10 years and have been advanced that it is going to fall apart because people can see it. That's number one. The second thing is if you notice that there has been more intense you know, scrutiny in social media. Why? Because the mainstream media is already domesticated. Already domesticated. They have a very little space to talk about. Now that if they allow the social media, you know, and we have seen previously that social media had engendered various kinds of movements, social movements, uh, road safety movement in 2018, August, or for that matter, the entire quota reform movement. And there are also, this has become the major source of communication and information, even when it is not creating a social movement. So these two things in the background of the, this deteriorating uh, freedom of expression situation that, that we are witnessing, what I am describing as pandemic of persecution. 
let me ask one thing as we are always uh, feel to say com we comfortably we say we have a very vibrant civil society so where are they because the, the civil society those who are representing you know they, they very few, few people are talking about these irregularities or even the autocratic regime or rules so why they are not talking about what's the main reason that question to me or ali yeah you, you will respond accordingly <laughs> after ali oh let me very briefly i'll, I'll wait to hear from ambassador Milam, but uh, very briefly, the, the, the entire, you know, uh, entire situation that we have seen uh, over the last years, uh, that the civil society has been weakened, constrained, you can say decimated to a great extent for various reasons. So the vibrant civil society that you are talking about, Mushfiq, was a matter of past over the last past five years. I think it has it has become weakened to that extent that there's very few feeble voices left. As a society, I'm not sure whether there is a robust civil society that can raise their voice. Yes, please, Ambassador Mailam, if you can watch. Well, yeah. I mean, yes, I, I was going to start off pretty much the same way uh, because I agree with Ali, uh, and but I was I would have put it a bit differently. I've been writing about this off and on for a long time. Not recently, I must admit, because I've given up on, on uh, things ever changing. But, you know, I've likened it to uh, George Orwell's 1984. There's a, I think there has become, over time, uh, because of the growing authoritarian power of the government, the growing surveillance, the growing uh, ability to, uh, to, uh, to hear and know what people are saying to each other and thinking maybe even there's been there's a pervasive fear fear that is overriding what used to be a, uh, uh, and i think pushing uh, against what used to be a fairly robust civil society to the point where it is no longer robust and people are afraid to stick their heads up and say anything and I mean, with a very, very with, with a, a few, a very few exceptions, and those are the the exceptions I can think of have enough international prestige so that touching, uh, harming them, taking them uh, would be would bring down a lot of uh, international pressure. But for most of the would be critics in 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 Bangladesh who don't really like what's going on. They're frightened out of their minds to even speak up because the next day they're going to disappear. Some of their family is going to be disappeared, something like that. So I think it's a pervasive feeling of fear that is going to be, that is probably going to uh, persist until the regime itself uh, falls or somehow uh, changes, which I don't see happening in the present circumstances. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Ali Riaz and Ambassador William B. Milam. It's a wonderful conversation, and obviously, we'll keep continuing with this type of conversation. Hope to see you next uh, anytime. See you soon. Thank you, Mushrik. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you very much.